tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. I should start by saying that I loved my daughter, despite what happened. I didn't mean for things to end up the way they did. Eileen was a beautiful and amazingly talented young girl. She was as sweet as they came, too, always on her best behavior, always using her best manners. And all around was an absolute angel. She used to love sports when she was little, and excelled in that, too. When she was little, I used to take her with me to my friend's house to watch football games every Sunday. Sometimes we'd throw a few passes in the front yard back and forth. As she grew up, she seemed to have a fondness for sports. So her mother and I began finding and plugging her into different athletic clubs. Eventually, she started trying out for stuff like the girls' football team in middle school, girls' soccer, after-school football clubs, stuff like that. She always got the spot and got to be very good at it. Through it all, I always saw her as my little star. I took pride that my daughter was, essentially, my mini-me. It wasn't a stretch to say she outdid me in more than a few ways. At her age, I, too, was all about athletics, football, wrestling, and even did some time running track. But whereas I was none too bothered with much else in life, say, my schooling, for example, and would let my grades go to shit. Eileen was always the driven pro star I was and still took home nothing less than B's on her report cards. I could always see her getting a full ride through a prestigious university in some sort of athletic scholarship. And that's another thing. Every one she tried out for. Football, soccer, track, and even fencing. I say all of this to say that I was a proud papa, but of course, it wouldn't always be this way. I remember it starting back in her freshman year of high school. She was playing defense in her first high school football game of the year. She kept a solid rock stance, just like I'd always taught her. I could see it in her eyes. She was determined that no one was getting past her. Unfortunately, the five foot nine behemoth with the ball in her arms had other plans and rammed Eileen at full speed, sending her flying almost two yard lines. I remember how me and at least half the crowd flinched when we saw that, like we were the ones that got hit. But shock slowly turned into panic when we saw that she hadn't gotten back up from the 60-yard line. She laid on the 60-yard line, writhing and clutching her legs. I couldn't hear her, but I could see that she was screaming. I bolted from my seat and ran out onto the field when I saw a team of first responders rush out about 10 minutes later to have her carried out on a stretcher. When I got to her, she was horrified, and she clutched her legs, screaming, I can't move my legs! Me and my wife Wendy immediately rushed to the hospital, where we were told that she'd suffered a severe spinal fracture in her lower back. They told us that, while it wasn't as bad as most, there was still only a slim chance she'd ever walk again, and even then, it wasn't likely that she'd be able to play any kind of sports anymore. This was, among other things, Devastating. Devastating to Eileen, who immediately burst into hysterics when she heard this, and me. I tried not to show it, but yes, that did get to me. Her being the family athlete, taking up my mantle, 
was every bit as much my hope and dream as much as it was hers. I know how utterly selfish and short-sighted that sounds, but it was true. I couldn't help it. Things were pretty ugly for a while after that. Eileen, who used to be one of the most hypersocial and outgoing people you'd ever meet, became isolated, closed off, where before me and Wendy would be damn near exhausting ourselves, though happily obliging, to get her everywhere she wanted to go. Now, we were struggling to even get her to come out of her room to eat dinner with us. I'd like to think I always tried to reinforce that I'd always love her and be proud of her, sports or no sports. School and her room were the only two places she'd be, and she'd rarely ever speak to us any times in between. Though we could get her into physical therapy, she was very slow to make progress. I could see she lacked the motivation to recover. She couldn't compete in she couldn't accomplish her dreams of being an all-star athlete, so why bother healing? I guess she figured, like I did, shamefully deep down, what was the point? This kept Wendy and I tossing every night, unable to sleep, on top of trying our best to accommodate her through most mundane tasks. We were always so worried that our daughter was going to essentially waste away because of her refusal to heal or move on. This made us bitter, not only with ourselves, not only with other people, but soon we became toxic with each other. I'd barely speak or even rarely look at Wendy for long periods. Anytime she wanted to speak to me, it was usually just to stress me or about how Eileen wasn't getting any better sometimes even blatantly blaming me for her drop in morale. I would never usually say anything when she did this. What could I have said? She may as well have been right. She was right then, just like she would be right about me again later. It was all my fault. Eventually, she was able to gain a little bit of use in her legs again though she still required the use of a cane and walked with a noticeable limp. She also couldn't be on her feet for prolonged periods, but it was still progress nonetheless. With this, she slowly regained a slight fragment of the person she once was. She still wasn't as perky or expressive as before, but I could see certain improvements in her behavior. Her face also seemed to lighten a bit mood-wise. While she didn't say much, she slowly began interacting with Wendy and me again. It was usually just, hey, or I love yous, with the occasional summary of how her school day was. After three months, Eileen was more or less better. She'd never be the same, though, and I knew that. I knew it, but I guess I never really accepted it. I guess it's like toxic nostalgia, isn't it? You remember something so fondly, fixating on it, that you'll find yourself unable to accept and adapt when things are different. You become so obsessed with the way things were that you detest the way things are now. And because of that, you try and force things to go back to what they used to be. Well, anyway, she was improving. She was getting better, while I essentially took her place as the one wasting away. While I could see her being able to move on, finding other ways to utilize her time and be productive, I never really tried to take the time to acknowledge it. From my perspective, she may as well have not gotten better at all. She still spends so much time in her room, away from us or the outside world. Whenever I'd get curious enough to ask, she'd always reply, I'm really busy with an important project. The same would be said whenever I tried to get her to do anything with me. At one point, I found out that these projects of hers were a new hobby she'd taken up. 
one that didn't involve her having to leave the house. Online gaming. One day, I remember glancing into her room as I passed down the hallway to see her nose buried in a computer game. She seemed focused on it, fixated even, like how she used to be with her athletics. It got to me, sure, but I did my damnedest not to let it show. This would occur a few times. I walked by to catch her devoting hours of energy and determination into that game. I told Wendy about it, telling her how devoted she was to this game. I told her that I didn't think it was healthy, this new obsession. But Wendy told me that she didn't think trying to force her to stop was a good idea. She's finally happy again, Walter. You really want to take that away from her? As much as I wanted to argue with that, how could I? For the most part, she was right. So instead, I just bore with it as best as I could. That was until we saw her grades in school begin slipping. What were constant A's and B's with maybe an occasional C became almost the complete opposite. When her last report, the second to last one of the year, came in the mail, and I saw that it was largely made up of C's and D's and even a couple of F's, I had put my foot down did something. Something I regret now, six months later, and will continue to regret as long as I am still alive. I went to pick her up from school like I usually did. This time, though, I didn't try to say anything like, how was your day, or anything like that. Not that it really seemed to matter to her. Even still, I think even she knew that something was up despite saying nothing about it. When we got home, before she could bunker herself in her room, I stopped her. Got something you mind explaining to me? I said sternly. She looked at me confused. She looked like she almost genuinely didn't know what I could have been alluding to, so I held up her report card. It's just poor eyesight, right? Brought on by old age? because I can't seem to think of any other reason I'm looking at this piece of paper here and seeing what looks like D's and an F. Her confusion instantly transformed into one of shock, before then sinking into one of panic. It looked like this was all just as much news to her as it was to me. I... I don't... She stammered. I, I didn't know. Didn't know what? that your grades were going in the toilet? I went over to the trash can, still purposefully not taken out for this reason, and pulled out the report cards from the last semester and held them up. Now do you see? So let's try this again. Why are your grades, grades that could have made you top of your classes, suddenly look like those of a dropout? She stood frozen wide-eyed and slack-jawed, struggling to try and say something. Anything. I don't know. I, I thought it was fine. I I've been busy with- That game. I blurted, interrupting her. Her eyes opened even wider. She must have thought I still didn't know about her special project. Yeah, that's right. I've seen what you've been doing. So let me get the story straight here. You've been screwing around on that computer game instead of focusing on your schoolwork. I'm, I'm sorry, she mumbled. But it's important, Dad. I felt my blood start boiling. Important? It's a video game. How the hell is that more important than your grades, huh? Explain that to me. No, I really want to know. She seemed at a complete loss for words. She started shaking a bit. I'd scared her. It's not just a, Then what is it, huh? What is it? And how does it justify your grades? It's a special project, Dad, and it's, it's becoming popular online. I, I can't explain it, but... That tore it. 
All right, you know what? Enough of this. Kiss your damn computer goodbye. I tried to let this go, but clearly that was a mistake. Immediately, her face went pale. Wait, she cried. Dad, you can't. It's a special project, please. I stomped my way past her to her room. She tried to give chase, hobbling behind me as fast as possible. Dad, stop, please. I ignored her. I was beyond bargaining at that point. I was hellbent on that computer getting thrown out of the fucking window. I made it to the room first and slammed the door, locking it, before starting to unplug and dismantle the CPU tower. Dad, stop! What are you doing? Her voice was absolutely hysterical and she pounded on the door furiously. I continued yanking loose all of the plugs graciously. My heart was racing with anger, adrenaline, and a sense of triumph. I was ridding myself of the source of my disappointment. Now, Eileen could go back to being my smart, successful little girl and quit wasting herself away with a fucking game. After yanking the CPU loose, I proceeded to smash it repeatedly into the floor. I ignored it, I ignored that, and I ignored the knocking sounds getting louder and louder and more violent. I remember hearing Eileen scream behind the door with every impact on the floor. Soon her shrieking and banging died down, and I could hear her loudly bawling behind the door. I stood up and took a deep breath. The computer was totaled, with the small glass and metal pieces and wires scattered across the floor. I felt proud of myself. I had done it. The computer, the distraction, was no more. I'd have my Eileen back. I opened the door, seeing her crumpled on the floor, sobbing. She shrieked again when she saw what remained of her computer, and immediately sprang up, throwing herself into the middle of the pile of shattered circuit boards and wires and began hugging them close to her chest. I simply kept walking, satisfied I'd done the right thing. I spent the rest of the day alone, thinking about what I'd just done. I began to wonder if I'd overreacted. Yeah, her grades were bad and all, but... Did I have to go and break her computer like that? I started thinking about what Eileen said about it. Not just being a game. And being a special project. That led me to wonder just what was this project. Deep down... I began to feel there was something more that I wasn't seeing. Funny how regret works, isn't it? Sometimes it doesn't sink in until much later. And sometimes, such as it was with me, until it was far too late. It had gotten late and Wendy was going to be home in an hour. So I began preparing supper. By then, I'd composed myself again and decided I'd try to bury the hatchet with Eileen after dinner. I even decided to make her favorite mozzarella-filled lasagna and bratwursts for dinner. Admittedly, I'd hoped to have caught her attention with the aroma. Sort of an early, look, I might have been a bit too harsh, I'm sorry type of deal, you know? But no. Dead silent. Just let her blow off some steam, I thought, continuing to make dinner. I heard the front door open, and Wendy came in right as I pulled the lasagna out of the oven. Hey, honey bun, welcome home. You're right on time for supper. Oh, thank God, I'm starving. I had to work through lunch again. What are you making? Mozzarella lasagna. Ooh, Eileen will love that. Well, I figured it's the least I could do. <laughs> what do you mean? I pulled out the report card and showed it to her. I had to say something to her. I began. She'd been so caught up with that game that her grades had been going in the toilet. I then showed her the previous report cards to reinforce my point. She looked at me nervously. Oh God, what did you do? I took her computer away until her grades came back up. I lied. 
She glanced towards her bedroom. Look, what was I supposed to do? Let her keep failing? She looked at me in disapproval. It'll be fine, I promise. I'm going to talk to her after dinner and make nice, and everything will be just fine. She looked back to the room again. Well, I'm going to check up on her. She then walked down the hall to her room. Let her know supper's ready. I called out, heading back into the kitchen. What came next happened so quickly, yet so slowly at the same time. It was like everything was put into slow motion. I remember my heart almost stopping dead two steps from the threshold between the kitchen and the dining room when I heard Wendy let out the most horrifying scream I'd ever heard. I remember being stuck in a shock-induced paralysis for about a solid ten seconds. Walter! Oh god, Walter, come quick! Eileen, she's... Oh my god! That's when I finally broke from my stupor and all but flew into the hallway. My blood went ice cold when I looked into the room. Wendy was on her knees in front of Eileen's open room, hands covering her mouth and quivering. The room was dark, but just enough moonlight filtered from her window to illuminate the most haunting scene I'd ever seen. It was Eileen. She lay out in the middle of the floor, still littered with the broken computer parts. Her eyes were wide open, staring up at the ceiling, lifeless. I ran over to her and cradled her in my arms. Eileen! Oh! Eileen, Jesus, Eileen! I started shaking her. Eileen, come on, baby, wake up, come on, come on, please wake up! She stared back up at me with her empty eyes. Her skin was cold and I retracted in horror when I tried shaking her arm. I felt something wet, and when I turned on the light, I damn near vomited. In one hand was the shard of one of the circuit boards. Her arms were opened wide across their lengths, and I saw that blood had pooled around her. I turned to Wendy and shouted for her to call 911. For a second, she didn't move, just staring back at me in shock. Damn it! Get the ambulance on the phone! She broke and ran into the living room to the phone. I sat there crying, hyperventilating while cradling and pathetically trying to shake my daughter awake. It was about 20 minutes later that the paramedics arrived. Two police officers and a paramedic had to pry me away from her. No! Let me go! I shouted, struggling to keep from being separated from her. Eventually, they got me out of the bedroom and into the living room, where my wife sat. After a moment, they questioned us about what led up to this point. They asked if there was any history of mental illness or violence in the family. No. Did either of you have a fight or something? Possibly getting physical? No. I exclaimed. No, no, we haven't ever fought. Not like that. What about a dispute? I was confused. I couldn't see how that was relevant. No, look, I took her computer away because her grades were failing. I didn't hurt her. The other officer pulled out a piece of paper and handed it to me. This was found with your daughter's body. I took it from the officer and read it right there. I'm sorry for wasting my life, Dad. I thought I could make something that would make you proud of me, like how I've made the rest of the world happy. I was wrong, though. I'm a failure. You deserve better. This time I couldn't stop myself. I threw up right where I stood. I couldn't believe what I'd just read. It was all my fault. Wendy immediately howled in grief when she saw this. I looked to the officers and stammered. I... I, I don't know. I don't... I didn't know. They looked at each other and back to me. 
I swear, I... I didn't even try to hurt her, I just... You fucking bastard! Wendy shrieked. This is your fault! You did this! I told you she was happy, and you took it away! I was trying to- To what? To get her to be what you wanted her to be? She was trying to make you proud! But it wasn't good enough for you! I clammed up. I couldn't say anything. As I said, she was right then. Just like she was right before. One of the officers stepped in and led Wendy away while the other stayed behind with me. I stayed speechless for a moment. The officer questioned me about the argument between Eileen and me, and I told him the truth. I'd taken away her computer by smashing it because of her grades. Things sort of went through the motions after that. Some time later, the officer with Wendy rejoined his partner and informed me that she had called for a friend of hers to pick her up and that she'd be staying the night there. Not long after that, the paramedics wheeled Eileen's body out of the room. Finally, everyone else left, and things were quiet again. Far too quiet. I was alone, and it was dead silent. Several things happened to me all at once. I started laughing which then turned into a rage fit where I began hitting the walls and knocking over everything in sight. Exhausted both physically and mentally, I finally collapsed and began bawling. I didn't see or hear from Wendy for the next two days. I didn't exactly bother trying to reach out either because I guess I knew what was coming. When she returned, she told me plain and clear that it was over. She spent the rest of the day packing bags of stuff she knew was hers and hers alone. I just watched. Of course, I wanted to argue, to beg her to stay, but I didn't. I accepted that this was what I deserved. The next month was spent like this. Wendy moved her stuff out of the house and went through the legalities to finalize the divorce. During this, Wendy agreed that I could have the house, claiming she just couldn't stand to be in the place anymore after what happened, and that she only wanted her half of the money in our joint bank account. So that was that. I was alone in an empty house without my wife or my daughter. And worst of all, I couldn't blame anyone but myself. It was all my fault. I don't remember much of what happened the next few weeks after the funeral. I couldn't sleep very well. I remember that. But so much time seemed to fly by in a blur that I couldn't keep up with it. I remember spending most nights in the bar, mostly so I wouldn't have to be alone in the house. And of course, this led to many nights being spent blacked out. It was last night, however, that I met Emmett. I remember he was sitting on the stool next to me, and he turned and asked if I'd heard of some new computer game that was going viral. He looked like what you'd expect a guy who spends most of his life with that shit would. Overweight, dirty looking clothes that reeked of pizza and chicken wings. Raggedy looking hair and a long unkempt beard. And was even wearing his headset around his neck. I looked at him, wondering what impression I gave off that made him think I gave the better part of two shits. Yeah man, he went on, clearly not getting the message. It's called Heart and Soul Online. Bro, you haven't heard of it? You gotta check it out. You play as this angel, right? A fallen angel, like Lucifer, you know? And you complete different quests to try and, like, get back into heaven. I stared blankly at him. The way he was talking 
mixed with what he was saying about this game, caused my mind to scramble. Yeah, and word has it, it's cursed. I cocked my eyebrows at him. Cursed, I asked, slurring. I was knee deep into my tenth round of Harwood Canadian, which didn't help my mood or ability to comprehend what he was going on about. <laughs> yeah, I, I see how it's affecting you, I retorted, now pissed drunk. He rambled for another ten minutes about how this game came out only a few months ago, in the pre-beta stage, whatever the hell that was supposed to mean, and that it was never finished, that supposedly stole the soul of the creator before it was finished. Yeah, it's been all over GameSpot, IGN. They say the creator's ghost is now trapped in the game, and if you play it for long enough, it'll assimilate your soul too. He made his eyes get big when he said this, like I was a little kid. He was trying to scare me with this hokey ghost story. Listen, Paul, I blurted. I'm not in the fucking mood for bullshit like this. Just leave me alone. This seemed to finally get through to him, and he threw up his hands and said, Sorry man, just thought you could use a distraction from life, you know? You look like you could use it. The name's Emmett, by the way. Seriously though, check it out. If you dare. He chuckled before getting up and waddling his way out of the bar. I ended up leaving almost immediately after. The horrible odor from Emmett tearing my nose apart and ruining any further interest in the liquor for the night. On the walk home, I couldn't get it out of my mind for whatever reason. Despite it being some load of shit he ripped off the internet like most everything else guys like him get their information from, Something was striking some sort of chord with me. Now, I've never been into video games, obviously. I'd never even touched a controller, and I wasn't a tech wizard either. As I said, I was always more the outdoorsy type. But, I guess because, as Emmett said, I needed a distraction. I couldn't stop thinking about what he'd said about a cursed game. In the end, I decided to look into it a bit more. Why not? What else was I supposed to do with my downtime in an empty house, alone, without any family? When I got home a little after midnight, still a good bit drunk, I decided to try and look up this supposedly cursed game. I typed in the heart and soul curse using my laptop, half expecting nothing to come up. Surprisingly, there were a good couple of articles talking about it. Most of them were from gaming websites and a couple of threads from various social media platforms talking about it. Skimming briefly over these, I saw that most of them were singing the game's praises and talking about how immersive and engaging the game and its plot is. Finally, I'd found out what I was looking for. It was a post titled, Mysterious Game, Heart and Soul Online. I clicked on it, sending me to a post on IGN.com that talked about the game being a hit MMORPG on Steam. According to the post, it gained mass amounts of popularity when it was released in the beta stage, only about six months ago. Apparently, it was never finished and the creator never reached out or responded to any fan mail. Rumor mills then overdrive about what happened to the game and its creator. Soon after, the so-called Curse of Heart and Soul Online was born. At least, that's what I read on the page. From there, there were posts damn near novel length about how the soul of the creator apparently haunts the game and the game will slowly steal your soul until you become trapped as well. A few of the posts had snapshots of the game with threads titled, 
ghost found in heart and soul online, or something bizarre like that. A few were posts made about players who were comatose after playing the game, having had their soul stolen by the game, as they put it. The shit people come up with these days, I thought, scrolling through. I stopped, though, when I saw that there was a download link to the game on Steam. The game's cover art was of what looked like an angel from a renaissance painting clutching a bleeding heart. Even drunk, I knew stupid when I saw it. I looked through the different images for the game. It appeared to be a game where you play as some angelic looking character running around this little fantasy world. One of the photos was labeled, Can You Regain the All-Father's Grace? There was no trailer or anything for the game. So I decided to skim the comments section to see if anyone had any information there. It was more or less the same as the forums though, with a few more wild stories about the curse Finally seeing that it was listed as free, I decided, screw it, and clicked the download button. Again, I don't know anything about how long games are supposed to take to download, but this took almost 15 to 20 to download to my laptop. When I clicked to start the game, the screen went black. For a couple of seconds, nothing happened. Great, the damn thing went and crashed my- I was cut off though, when I saw the words, Forgive me father, appear in the middle of the screen, followed by thunder. The black screen then faded to a scene of the angel character from before, falling through a sea of clouds and crashing onto a large rock, lying on his back. Then the options for new and load game popped up. I paused for a moment. I couldn't tell at the time why, but something felt off about this. The words on the screen are followed by a scene of an angel lying broken and battered on a rock with gray, gloomy skies all around. Look, I get stuff like this might be what kids are into these days, but something still unsettled me. It wasn't just that, though. After about another minute of watching the angel lay on the rock while lightning flashed around him, I clicked new game. A loud thunderclap was heard, and for a moment, I saw the angel raise and look straight at me with fiery red glowing eyes before the screen went black again. It felt... Sad. Ten seconds later, the screen opened to a scene in a cemetery with the angel standing in front of a headstone labeled Walter. This threw me a bit. How the hell was my name in the game? I hadn't even been asked to create any name for the character. The only explanation I could come up with for this was that the game somehow tapped into my email. How, though, was anyone's guess? I should say about all of this is that the actual game itself looked halfway decent in terms of graphics. I mean, that's not much coming from a guy who's only used to seeing everything looking like pixels on a screen when it came to video games. But this looked like whoever made it especially for being a so-called indie title, as the tag suggested, really knew what they were doing when it came to graphic design. Everything was clear and smooth, both in how the game looked and the animation. I started pressing different buttons to see what they'd do. The only thing that seemed to work, though, was the mouse, using that to move the camera. Suddenly, a box of text appeared, reading, You have disgraced me. You are a favored squire, and you have failed me. As penance, I cast you down. 
This was followed by another that read, Please, Father, grant me a reprieve. I will make amends. After this, I was given full control of the character. I began moving Walter around the graveyard. As I passed by each of the graves, I started hearing the sounds of screaming. At one point, I stopped in front of one, which prompted me to push a key to interact with it. This was followed by the picture of a young girl's face that had been rendered in 3D along with the caption, I failed him, now I lie with her. When the screen returned, I saw that the headstone was labeled with the name Francine. This made me pause again. Who was this? Unlike the rest of the game, this looked more like an actual person's photo. Maybe the game utilizes the camera? With this in mind, I got a piece of paper and taped it over the lens on my laptop. I then went back to traversing the graveyard. The graves all seemed the same labeled with different people's names and showing their faces with the same message. Admittedly, this was starting to get to me, and I'd have shut the game off and deleted it had it not been for the appearance of a large swirling sphere and the command to press enter to travel the ether sphere. Hesitantly, I pressed it and the screen went black again. When it came back, Walter was in the middle of some sort of market square. Another text box appeared reading, I must regain the Allfather's love. I will start with aiding these mortal peasants. I moved Walter up to one character who looked to be a market clerk. The clerk then spoke through a text box, asking me to go fetch some objects a trinket. Below the text was two options, accept or refuse. After thinking about it, I moved the arrow to accept. That's when a map with the objective being labeled in red and a timer came up, displaying that I had a minute and a half to complete the objective. I was slow moving at first, not having any sort of understanding of what the hell to do. I mean, just learned how to move the character around. Now, though, I'd had barely any time to complete my first task. I'd managed to grab the trinket and was on my way back to the market clerk when the timer ran out. In big, bold letters, the screen read failure. After this, nothing happened, at least not in the game. That was the first time I noticed something, though. It was very slight barely noticeable, but, but I felt lighter somehow. I don't know how to explain it, but somehow it felt like something was taken out of me after failing that first objective. I figured it was just the liquor screwing with me. I was still pretty buzzed at the moment, but on the left hand side of the screen, I saw a number appear. 90%. What is that, some sort of progress tracker? I began walking around again in the village area. I was stopped again by another villager, looking like a woman from colonial times, presenting me with a dagger and telling me that she believed her husband has cheated on her and wanted the mistress out of the picture. The choice appeared again, except or refuse. This time, I didn't feel right accepting the task. It was one thing to find a missing item, but becoming a hitman, essentially? I selected refuse. This turned out to be the wrong decision, though, as the villager got mad, stormed off, and the word failure appeared on the screen again. I felt it. That weird, draining feeling. This time, it was a bit more noticeable. It felt more like I'd been slugged in the stomach hard. I even felt a little out of breath. 
I looked at the numbers in the corner of the screen to see that they'd changed to 83%. What the? What the hell is going on here? Admittedly, I couldn't help but think back to the stuff I'd read earlier about the curse. About how it steals your soul or whatever. While I was entirely inexperienced with video games, I was sure they weren't supposed to do shit like this. Keep in mind that I wasn't a believer in ghosts or curses, but I can't lie and say that I had any real explanation for what was going on. Even blaming the alcohol seemed more like a stretch now. The next task I took on was catching a thief who'd stolen fruit from the market clerk. I saw that he was running, and so I moved to give chase. As I was failing behind, I was worried that I'd fail another mission when another prompt popped up. Press X to engage flight. Curse or not, though, I told myself that I was going to make damn sure that, going forward, I was going to complete the objective successfully. A large pair of wings sprouted from Walter's back, and he began gliding through the air. I quickly caught up and seized the thief, who turned out to be a small child. The child pleaded through a text box not to turn him over to the authorities, and that he only wanted to feed his family. Then another set of options appeared. Judgment or Grace. I was about to click on Judgment when I paused. Far in the background, was what looked to be the transparent outline of a person staring at me. It was hard to see. But it appeared female, and was a baby blue color. She stood still with small strands of her hair swaying in the wind, staring at the screen with two pitch black eyes. This made me feel very unsettled. I couldn't tell why, but I felt like whatever this was, it somehow knew what I was going to do. Like it knew that I was going to press judgment, and that I would be judged along with this kid in the game. Then a text box appeared. Must be nice, living all alone in your glass house. Huh? I said aloud. What the hell was that supposed to mean? Shaking this off, I decided to click Judgment anyway. This was met with a black screen that transitioned back to the market where the kid was being arrested. He was shown crying, looking almost realistic too. It wasn't cartoonish like I expected, but it almost looked like an actual kid crying. I commented on the way the game looked before, but this was where I'd started noticing the level and attention to detail. It showed a close-up of his face with a text reading. I was only trying to bring food back to my little sister. Then the word success flashed across the screen, followed by the number increasing to 87%. Aside from the initial relief of not feeling those weird effects again, I felt the shame somehow. Like I'd still made the wrong decision. Another text box appeared beside the number. How does it feel? What? Who the hell? I was cut off when another one popped up reading. I'm your little angel. Now I was alarmed. How did it respond so quickly? Could it hear me? Maybe through the microphone. What does it mean by my little angel? How does success feel? I broke from my train of thought to see her standing in the distance again. Another text box instantly replaced the words. How does it feel about devoting your energy, your soul, into something and still feeling wrong? How does it feel to always fear failure? To fear that you can't be loved. By this point, I was two seconds from wanting to close the laptop and never look at the damn thing again. The next text box, though, 
made my blood freeze solid. You only truly lose when you quit. That was the same exact line I'd always given Eileen. How could this game have known that? Before I could dwell on this any longer, the girl was gone, and I was left to roam around again. For a solid ten minutes, I just did nothing. I was lost. My head was spinning so fast that I couldn't catch my breath for long enough to cry out. Who or what was this thing? And what did it know about me? Eventually, the feeling came back and I saw the number drop to 78%. That was another thing that was bothering me. What was this number? What was its connection to the sickening feeling in my body? I started to feel like I was starving. Actually, like I was being starved. Like someone was pulling the inside of my stomach out of me. Another text box appeared from Walter. The All-Father is not pleased. I must act quickly to placate him. Thinking quickly, I began scrambling to find another quest. I remembered how the pain eased when I performed a task successfully. Luckily, it wasn't long before such an opportunity presented itself. It was another fetching assignment to find a lost pet lynx that had run off. I was gifted a whole extra minute to find the damn thing and bring it back this time. Like before, once I'd pulled off the task successfully, the pain went away. Slightly, I noticed then that the number only increased from 75 to 76.5. Why did it not go up anymore? Was it not enough? What do I have to do to... I stopped. Another text box read. You can't just stop when you think you've done enough. The Allfather demands the best from you, as he did from me. All right, I exclaimed. Start talking. Who are you? What do you want from me here, huh? I know you can hear me. What's going on? What's happening to me? I failed him. Many failed him. And now their souls lay trapped with me, forever rotting away. And yours will too, unless you please the All-Father. Who? She then listed a bunch of people's names. My confusion was replaced with dread when seeing the name Francine again. I realized these were the names from the graveyard at the beginning. This led to another much more horrible suggestion. Could these be the same people who went comatose after playing this game? Another text box appeared as the aches came again, reading, How does it feel, Walter, to always fear failure? Soon the aches came back so bad that I felt myself going faint. My heart racing now and my vision blurred. That's when I decided enough was enough and shut the laptop. When I caught my breath again, it took everything in me not to throw the damn thing and run out screaming like a lunatic. It almost took five minutes to realize it was daylight outside. I was still a bit woozy and I felt extremely nauseous. My stomach turned over and I had to dash to the bathroom to empty it. So, why am I explaining all of this to you? What keeps me from passing this all off as another night wasted so badly that I started psyching myself out with a ghost story? Well, well all day I've been feeling horrible, between my stomach feeling like I described earlier like someone was ripping it out of me and my head constantly feeling dizzy. I was worried that at any moment I'd pass out. Despite being exhausted, I haven't slept. I'm afraid to. I couldn't get all of the names out of my mind. The faces, 
the gravestones. I felt that they had to be connected somehow, so I decided to look up the articles again. And just as I'd feared, every one of them had articles, some in the obituaries, all having slipped inexplicably into a coma after playing Heart and Soul online. I decided to look and see if I could find the creator, possibly even contact them. That was when I'd find the most damning discovery. Heart and Soul Online, released October 14th, 2021, by Eileen Varen. This caused me to have a bolt to the bathroom again. Eileen made this, my, my little angel, my, my little angel. And that was when it clicked. The thing in the game said she was my little angel. And this game was released just a month before she died. Thinking again about what the article said about the game being haunted by a ghost, I wondered, was that Eileen speaking to me in the game? This caused me to think about what she said about fearing failure. I remembered how every failure resulted in feelings of emptiness. I've also thought about how each of the graves stated that they failed. Their souls lay trapped here, with me forever rotting away. And yours will too, unless you please the All-Father. I think I understand what's going on now. After being rendered unable to succeed at sports, my daughter created this game to make me proud, devoting her heart and soul to it. But like how mine and other people's efforts weren't enough to please the All-Father, my disdain towards her efforts tore her down until it destroyed her. Somehow. Eileen's spirit manifests through this game by reflecting her anger, pain, and sorrow onto others, and destroying them as well. I'm telling you this to say that I'm sorry, and that I'm scared. It's getting harder and harder and harder to stay awake. I think it's the game. I'm not playing it, so I'm not succeeding at anything. And the All-Father is disappointed. I have to keep playing. I have to succeed. Or I'll be rotting with them all. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.